This is One on One. Uh, the PBS family is honored to have here in our Lincoln Center studio Arlene Alda, who is the author of Just Kids from the Bronx. How you doing? I'm great. How are you today? I'm doing great. This book, Just great. Kids from the Bronx, telling it the way it was in oral history. Um, by the way, your husband, his name again? Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> someone you might know. I don't know, Alan? Alan Alda, married yeah. for 58 years. Yeah, 58 years. It does seem like yesterday. We're, we're an old cliche. No, you're Seems not. Seems like yesterday. Except he was not, there's the two of you right there, like in that shot right there. Now, you, 58 years, but he was from Manhattan. Well, he was born in Manhattan. Right. He's not in the book, you know. No, he's so, not. So, you know, so it doesn't matter where he's born. But he's from Manhattan, but as a kid, he went on tour with his father, who was an actor. So he was, he was on trains and buses and cars and whatever until he was about, I don't know, four, five, six. Then they moved to California at one point. And you hooked up over at Fordham? And he went, uh, they came back when he was a teenager, and he went to Fordham U. And yeah. you met, met there? We met when he was a senior, but I had already graduated Hunter. So I, I was a Hunter, as they said in those days, Hunter girl. C can you do a real quick version? Because I want to talk about all the people like Al Pacino and uh, Colin yeah. Powell and so many sure. other people in the book. Real quick, you met Alan over, was it cake falling yeah, up? Yeah, what? yeah, yeah, rum cake falling off the top of a refrigerator <laughs> at a mutual friend's house. Yeah, and we were the only two people at the dinner party. Went in with our spoons and ate the cake off the floor. Was it love yeah. at first? Absolutely. I mean, who could resist? <laughs> so there it is. Uh, let's do some of the people. By the way, why did you write this book? Okay, the book, well, the book is a celebration of people from the Bronx. And there are a lot of great people from the Bronx. And I wrote it because most, most other people do not know how great the people from the Bronx are. You know, people such as Colin Powell and Al Pacino and Regis Philbin and uh, Daniel Liebeskin and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Mary Higgins Clark and, and the list goes on and on. And of course, the, the Bronx Borough President, Ruben Diaz Jr., mm. uh, uh, Tats Crew, graffiti artists, so on. What did the Bronx, before we talk about Al Pacino, one of my <laughs> favorite actors of all time, um, what did the Bronx mean to you? Well, when I was growing up, I, I keep thinking it was in two segments. Until I went to high school, it was my territory. I owned it. It was my neighborhood, my building, my everything. Because I, I loved every brick in that big Mayflower building. I loved all the streets. I explored the parks, the stores. I knew people. They knew me. It was great. Went to high school, all of a sudden I realized, well, wait a minute, I have other interests. And the interests sent, at that time centered on music. And then Manhattan beckoned, because all the concerts and uh, what I was interested in and the arts were in what we called the city. How far away was Manhattan for real? Only while, while it was yeah. blocks, miles away. How, I mean, I'm from Jersey. Yeah. It was really far away. It is. I mean. Like still a kid from Jersey, I, just the idea we're at the WNET studio here in the heart of Lincoln Center, 66 and Broadway, I'm like, we're here. Did you feel yeah. the same way? No, because the subway was the connecting link. We all went on the subway at an early age. So at an early age, I even took lessons, piano lessons, in Manhattan. So Manhattan was, was linked to us, but it was an hour's ride mm. from where I lived in the Bronx to let's say Times Square, Grand Central, and but I learned, you know, kids all learn how to do that early. Now it would be called child abuse. Yeah, right. Exactly. A lot of <laughs> things would kid, be. <laughs> you put your kid on a train and say, "Not no. today." Ready to do Al Pacino? Pardon me. Let's talk about Al Pacino. We're going to yes. show a picture of Al Pacino. You're going to tell us a little yes. bit about what he talked about uh, growing okay. up in the Bronx. Go ahead. Okay. Al was brought up uh, in a divorce household at a time when that was not so common, and his mother, he and his mother, moved in with the mother's parents uh, in a small tenement apartment in the Bronx. And the mother had to go out to work, but on weekends, she'd take the young kid, her only child, to the movies a lot. 
And so at the ages of three and four and five, he was already going to the movies with his mother. He may not have understood what he mm. saw, but it meant something to him. So much so, he'd come home and act out these scenes that he remembered to his grandparents. You know, and he adored his grandfather, who he described as a wonderful storyteller who came from Sicily. He was yes. uneducated but smart. And uh, they'd go up to the rooftop in the, you know, in the spring and the summer when everyone went up to the rooftops to get, right. you know, breezes. And in those days, actually, there was fresh air, even on the roof. You talk uh, about back in yeah. the day. I'm sorry for interrupting. There's so many people I want to talk about. Regis Philbin, the Depression. Yeah, yeah. Got Reg a picture of him right there. Talk about him. Yeah, <laughs> sweet. Uh, Regis, love Regis, friend of mine lives in the same building we do, or we live in the same building he does in Manhattan. Right. Ended up in the same building. But uh, I didn't know him in the Bronx. And he was this kid growing up in the, the Depression, uh, another only child. And he grew up uh, listening to the radio. And the radio was his link to these great songs. And the songs were sung by his idol, Bing. Crosby. Not Sinatra. Well, this was before Sinatra. You know, oh, we're that's talking right. It was more like the 40s. 30s. So Sinatra was more the 40s. Exactly. That's, so Bing Crosby was bigger. He was the biggest. Bing Crosby was like big. And Bing Crosby was in the 30s. Not only was he with the big bands, but then he was a big movie star. Mm. So this was really before Sinatra. And this little kid sang all the songs that he could that he could remember from you know listening to the radio and ultimately when he <laughs> he tells his story of you know being uh, Joey Bishop's sidekick on Joey Bishop's when he show had a big many, talk show yeah big talk show later much later on and Bing Crosby was a guest one time and that had to be huge for Regis yeah it was it still carried on through all those years, this uh, this wonderful feeling about Bing Crosby. Can you give me real quick, even though I want to talk about Chaz Palminteri, one yeah. of my favorites, because he did The Bronx Tale, um, yeah. after seeing that murder right in the Bronx yeah. growing up. Can yeah. you do Mary Higgins Clark real quick? Mary Higgins Clark grew up uh, near Pelham Parkway, a much more rural suburb, not even suburban. When she was Closer a to kid, Westchester was County? Uh, Pelham Park, is it? Well, it's when you, say rural. I mean, you know, it's in the Northeast. Okay. Uh, by the way, all of the Bronx was part of Westchester County at one point, until the 1890, about 1898. But Mary Higgins Clark grew up with a, in a comfortable family. Uh, the world was her oyster, too, until tragedy struck. And at age 11 or 12, her father died suddenly. And then the mother was hard pressed. To, uh, to keep the house going, so she took in borders. Mm. But after five years, they had to move out. And then ultimately, uh, Mary Higgins Clark didn't go to college immediately. Mm. She went out to work. And she talks about her early part-time work experiences as a, uh, a, what you call, a telephone operator in a Manhattan Hotel, wow. you know, in the Coming days the when you had, yeah, you had these, you know, plug-in things. Oh, let me ask you something. Why? Because there's Manhattan, there's yeah. Queens, there's Brooklyn, there's Staten Island, but there's and the, the Bronx. Bronx. Okay. The Bronx. Yeah. Because? Well, okay. The <laughs> There are a couple of stories about What's that. What's your and version? Then, okay. The name of the guy, well, this is true name of the guy who settled in 1639, settled a part of the Bronx and had 500 acres to farm. His name was Jonas Bronk, B-R-O-N-C-K. Oh, and the, the river was in, uh, south of his land. And you might say that, that the borough was named after the Bronx, the family, the Bronx, or the Bronx, Right. Or the Bronx River. But it, it, it stems from Jonas Bronk. Uh, real quick, a Bronx accent versus Brooklyn. 
Rick Meyerowitz has the best explanation. He's a great illustrator, writer, funny guy. Uh, Rick says, uh, he asked his father, what's the difference between a Bronx accent and a Brooklyn accent? And his father says, uh, well, a uh, Brooklyn accent, they say, uh, uh, I'm gonna murder the, I'm gonna murder the bum. And in the Bronx, they say, I'm gonna murder the bum. Either way, the guy's dead. <laughs> Either way, the guy's dead. In, in Jersey, there's a slightly different accent. Um, uh, can we do Chaz that. commentary? Because he did the Bronx tale, which is yeah. great. Go ahead. Chaz, Chaz, as a kid, uh, actually did witness a murder. Uh, which he talked about in the movie. Which he talks about in the movie. And, in the uh, Bronx. In the Bronx, sitting on the stoop. Just looking at as a kid. He was a kid, 10, 11 years old, sitting on the stoop. Two cars come, one starting to park. Another guy comes out, and before he knows it, bang, bang, and someone's dead. And his father, who was upstairs, hear the shot, grab the kid, take him upstairs. Meanwhile, his mother's crying, and then the police come. Police come, they want to have the kid as a witness. Keep your and mouth then, shut. And the father said, he's only a little boy, he doesn't know anything, you leave him alone, and finally convinced the police to leave him alone. In the movie, he said he changed it slightly so that the kid, uh, I think, is a witness. And I recently re-saw the movie, I don't mm. recall, but the, the um, it, it, it's a, a all true, you know, the father, the bus driver, the, the pull between being with the mob and being this working man and this working class man, this honest guy who wants to bring up his kid. Real quick, um, Colin Powell, she had great Colin things, Powell. came from the Bronx. Love 30 seconds, Colin go ahead. Powell. Okay, flying kites on a, on a rooftop, again, the rooftop. He's, on the kite is razor blades and pulverized glass flying the kites Cutting the kites of the of kids' kites a block away, World War II, shooting down the planes. Precursor. Uh, the stories are fabulous. The book is called Just Kids from the Bronx, um, an oral history. Arlene, all I cannot thank you. You honor us and the WNET family thank you by very joining much. us. Thank you so much. Thank okay, you. Go and get Pleasure the book. being here. This is great thank stuff. You. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Wells Fargo, the New Jersey Education Association, NJIT, Barnabas Health, MagnaCare, New Jersey Sharing Network, and by the Mental Health Association in New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.